guys, I'm Sherry coming at you today in Raid Shadow Legends. Welcome to the video, guys. I'm happy to have you here today. Send us some positive vibes, some love your way, especially if you're going through something, if you need to know that. One of my favorite quotes out there in the world, one of my favorite, I guess, philosopher kings out there in the world is good old Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic King himself. You have the power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength, guys. Just know if you're going through something, as I said, you will get through this, things will get better. Care about you and send us some love your way today to start off this video. And today's video is gonna be an updated 50 tips for 2023 in Raid Shadow Legends. So I went ahead and I aggregated some new tips, some old tips, put them all together, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced player who's been playing Raid Shadow Legends for a few years. Hopefully you pick up something from today's video. Let's start with the real, real basic. We're gonna get this easy one out of the way with, out the gate here, and that is the starting champions. I still think that Kale is the best starting champion to go with. In the early game of Raid Shadow Legends, Kale is the best starter because he has poisons. Poisons are instrumental, not just for clan boss, but for dragon as well and they'll help you out the big version on his a3 the small version on his a1 and he's a great campaign farmer with a turn meter fill on his a2 all of the campaign starters have the increased ally hp in all battles which you're going to want to probably be using them early on as your aura lead so i think still kale is still the best however elhane and uh Aethel, personally uh, i really like them in the mid to the end game so you really can't go wrong with either of those three champions galek he's kind of another story but he's not an awful champion you are all of you beneath me I am a god, you dull creature, and I will not be bullied by that. Well, I think we're making progress. Number two is going to be, we're going to kind of scale up in difficulty here as we get to these tips. Number two is another basic one, but a lot of new players don't realize this. And that is if you go over to campaign, no matter which difficulty level you're on, normal, hard, brutal, or nightmare, uh, level three, stage three is going to give you more silver. That's for a simple reason. On any single level, any single stage, if you're going to be farming in campaign, shields in this game sell for a little bit more silver than other artifacts. So best bang for your buck in terms of silver while you're campaign farming is to farm stage 12-3 uh, for experience and HP. If you can't get 12-3 uh, brutal, then do 12-3 normal, do 12-3 hard until you can get to 12-3 brutal. That's going to be the best bang for your buck in terms of experience and in terms of uh, getting the best silver, maximizing your silver. Tip number three, guys, is going to be speed and accuracy our king in Raid Shadow Legends. Now, a lot of players don't really recognize this in the very beginning of Raid Shadow Legends, but even those starter champions that we talked about, let's just pick a random rare champion here as kind of an example. Uh, let's go with Coldheart, right? So Coldheart, fantastic champion. She's got this A3 ability where she's decreasing target's turn meter by 100%. A lot of new players don't realize whether or not, even though we're not landing a debuff per se here, we're still manipulating the target's turn meter. Whenever we're doing something to the opponent, other than damage, essentially, we need accuracy. So the best place to get your accuracy is probably going to be from the banner uh, once you fully six-star ascend these champions. So you can see I have an accuracy banner on this Coltart. So accuracy and speed are going to be super, super important. Make sure you're nailing speed on your boots and accuracy on your banner, especially in the early game of Raid Shadow Legends. After that, you'll know enough where kind of more versatility will open up in terms of where you want to put your stats. You can look at some maybe unorthodox builds with attack percentage, defense percentage on the boots and stuff like that. But for for the beginning in the intermediate kind of you know first year or so raid shadow legends you pretty much want to be looking for speed on your boots again and accuracy on your banners okay in speed and accuracy you know what artifact set has both speed and accuracy it just goes to show you the value of perception sets where you get 40 accuracy and 5% speed. We'll talk more on that later. Tip number four is going to be farming stages in dungeons. Okay. There's two big thresholds that I want to talk about here and it applies to every dungeon, but we're just going to look at dragons Lair to kind of start out here. So farming dungeon 13 should be your first kind of goal. Getting to the dungeon thir level 13, stage 13 on any dungeon level. Why? Because 13 and above 13 and above, you're going to have a shot at getting six star gear, okay? Six star gear is going to be fantastic. It's going to give you a big upgrade on all of your champions. So the first order of business in terms of dungeon farming, in terms of artifacts in this game that are available in dungeons is to get to stage 13 to get that six star gear. Now, the other one, this is tip number five, is 
Farming stage 16 plus should be your next goal because at 16 all the way to level 25 in any dungeon, you are no longer going to get a chance of getting mystery shards or brews, XP brews to use in the tavern. Now, why don't you want mystery shards and XP brews? Because they're taking the place of what would be a solid artifact otherwise. So you don't have to worry about those kind of, I don't know, crappy filler rewards when you get to stage 16 and beyond. So after 13, 16 should be your next goal. Tip number six is going to be rotation. Now we have a whole video about all the ways that rotation matters in Raid Shadow Legends, but just a quick few ones for you guys in case you weren't aware. <laughs> I don't want to burn gems on a key right now. Let's just go ahead and pull up a campaign match to keep things simple here. Let's go to stage three where we can get the best bang for our buck on the shield. This is position number one here in the leader, right? Number two is up here. Number three is over here. Number four is over there. That is the positioning, okay? Now, position doesn't matter for, you know, who goes next, for example, because it's going to be predicated on the speed of the champions, obviously, on your team. But it does matter for other stuff, such as ally attack. It's going to go each ally on an ally attack attack ability is going to be joining that attack in order of where they are on said, you know, turn rotation order. So, for example, if I have a champion like, I don't know, Ray, for example, right? Ray is a legendary champion who on her A1 ability, which is what they're going to be using on their auto attack, she has an awesome ability that places decreased defense. So, why do I mention all of this? There she goes. So, let's just pretend I had an ally attack champion here in the first spot. Uh, number two, or the first one to go is going to be Ray, AoE attack decreased defense. Now, if I had other champions in spot three and spot four, well, who are just doing damage like a champion like skull crown for example right it's going to be great to have ray positioned ahead of her so we can land that decreased defense first and then we'll have the whole table kind of set for skull crown and the other champions we want to use in a blender comp now same thing goes for single target revivers guys if we have a reviver say in it doesn't really matter what position the actual revivers in but let's just say that we have Sil the drakes as our reviver on this team well she's going to prioritize let's just say we get hit by an aoe attack and all three of these champions die she's going to prioritize reviving the champion who is in by position order you know so it's going to be Sathalia first it's going to be Eleanor Rill second and it's going to be Tila third now if we have like two revivers on the team we'd probably want to prioritize reviving the other revivers so in this case we'd get Cardinal first whereas if we had Cardinal way back here she would not be reviving Cardinal and we wouldn't have our other reviver kind of ready to go there's a lot of other ways that turn order affects things inside the game and again I'll refer you to that other video where we talk all about rotation and how it affects everything in this game all right guys tip number seven is the value of damage mitigation passives. They are so freaking good in this team. I'm just gonna show you a few of my favorites here. We have Tagore, who's an epic champion from Orcs. He has a passive, decrease the damage allies received by 50% or less by 10%. These are great. It's kind of like a built-in, straight out, raw damage mitigator. That really adds up, especially when you stack them with other buffs, such as strengthen, such as uh, increased defense, okay? Uh, probably the most famous one is going to be Lydia, but there's a bunch of them in the game they keep adding more that is added Pythion as well. So these, be on the lookout for these really strong passive that decrease uh, damage taken either from AoE attacks or, you know, a bunch of other factors. Everybody's a little bit different, generally speaking. Thick skin on Norog, if they have one or more buffs, 15% damage mitigation. If they have no buffs, 25% damage mitigation. These abilities are very, very powerful. Tip number eight is the power of grant and extra turn abilities, guys. So grant and extra turn are super, super powerful. If we go to Aethel, one of the starting champions she has on her a3 grant gains an extra turn or grants an extra turn either or uh these are great because what it does is is not only you know do you get a turn back to back but because you're getting an additional turn you're actually going to be reducing the cooldown of their other skills as well. So let's say we use Divine Blades first, and then the next time we come around, Divine Blades is still on a two-turn cooldown. We use the extra turn, boom, that turns into a one-turn cooldown. We can use the A1, then it's going to be free to use the next turn. This game has done nothing but just confuse me, bro. I know it's kind of convoluted. Maybe it's that, that was not the easiest way to describe it, but there's a bunch of champions like that in the game. And these champions are inherently super, super powerful. For Such as, again, Deacon Armstrong. Grant, get, grants an extra turn now, not gains. Grants an extra turn that's going to allow you to essentially take this from what would be a three-turn cooldown when you book him 
to a two turn cooldown and keep that decreased defense up more often than not on all enemies. So this grant and extra turn abilities, there's a lot of them in the game. Again, they're very, very powerful. Keep an eye out for those skills. Tip number nine is the power of A1 cycling. So at the end of a wave here, right before the mobs are about to die, what you want is all of your skills to be off cooldown, especially when you're in a dungeon or a doom tower floor that's really, really challenging, right? So going into every round with a fresh, all of your skills off cooldown is going to really greatly uh, increase your chance of actually making it to the boss or making it through the waves. So once all the enemies are close to dead, we just want to pound away with all of our A1 abilities, our first abilities here, rather than use really valuable abilities such as Seal of Magic right now or such as Abyssal Gaze. We want to keep these abilities to use during our next round, during our next wave. So A1 cycle on all of our champions is going to take a few extra turns, but it's going to buy us time so we have a nice clean slate and able to use all of our more valuable and strong skills that are now off cooldown because again, we were able to cycle all of our A1s until the cooldowns were refreshed on our stronger abilities. Tip number 10 is to clear difficult waves or very difficult dungeons, Doom Tower floors, and Raid Shadow Legends. Take advantage of stun sets with Fearsome Presence Mastery. Fearsome Presence is going to take that stun from an 18 to a 23%. Does not require accuracy to land stuns or any debuffs from artifact sets, only casting those abilities. So here we go, Secret Room 12. I just made a video on this if you guys want to check out the whole entire strategy. But I do have one champion in a shield set just in case we do get hit and then I have the rest of the champions in stun sets with that fearsome presence so you can see stun 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 guess what guys if they never take a turn we will not lose we're already seeing three stuns here we only have one enemy who is not stunned and the idea is we keep doing this because again not to belabor the point but hey if they never go we never have to worry about losing. This is a great way to clear any super difficult content inside Raid Shadow Legends. Tip number 11 is gonna be essential masteries for a debuffing champion on your team. Eagle Eye is gonna give them more accuracy. We already talked about the importance of accuracy. It's not mandatory, but it's really nice to get that plus 50 accuracy. Same thing with pinpoint accuracy, charge focus, and swarm smiter. Now, in addition to that, we have arcane celerity, 30% chance to in increase the term meter by 10% when a debuff cast by this champion is removed or expired. Well, obviously, they're going to be a debuffer, so they're going to in inherently benefit really nice over the course of a longer battle from this Arcane Celerity. And then the last one is going to be Master Hexer. The chance at increasing the duration of a debuff is incredibly powerful. Granted, it will not affect the CC debuffs, but it's still really, really nice. And Sniper, if there's not a 100% chance to land a debuff, Sniper will give you an additional 5% chance of doing so. Again, it will not affect stun, sleep, freeze, so it won't work for a stun set. That's where you want to pick up some presence as we spoke about earlier. Tip number 12 is great buffer masteries. People who are just landing buffs on your allies, helping them to keep alive. Here we have Sifi the Lost Bride. What better example than that? Well, you can see that she has rapid response. It's kind of like the opposite of debuffs with arcane celerity. This one applies to buffs. 30% chance of increasing the term meter by 10% when a buff cast by this champion is removed or expires. The other one that's really important is lasting gifts. 30% chance to extend the duration of any buff cast by this champion, similar to kind of the inverse of Master Hexer. Those are my favorite buffing masteries to have on any champion. But while we're here, tip number 13 is going to be the best healing masteries. So we want to come in with Steadfast, increase our max HP. A lot of heals are based on the uh, the caster's max HP, so generally this is pretty good to pick up anyway. And then we have Lay on Hands, going to increase the value of heals by 5%. We have Healing Savior, increase the value of heals and shields by 10% if the target has 40% HP or less. And then we go down to Merciful Aid. So again, uh, even a curing set is worth considering for a really, really strong healer, getting that nice increase on all the heals that they're otherwise going to be casting. What about nuking mastery? So for an arena nuker, guys, I love starting with deadly precision. If you need the crit rate, if you don't, just go with the attack on blade disciple and then come down. Definitely grab the keen strike for extra crit damage. Come down and pick up the shield breaker. And then most importantly, we love ruthless ambush, an additional 8% for the first attack on each enemy for the arena. This is going to be really valuable opportunist if you're setting them up with a stun sleep fear any of the cc debuffs an extra 12 percent is going to be money for you guys and then of course for arena nukers or against waves against other champions not necessarily bosses helm smasher is going to be the best going to give you a chance at ignoring defense and the best artifact set is going to be savage
or lethal. So tip number 15 is the best tank masteries for building a tank, guys. So we want to pick up either blast proof, AOE attacks reduction damage by 5% for PvE content, or improved parry for PvP content, reduced damage by AOE or by critical hits, excuse me, by 8%. So one of the other, uh, blast proof or improved parry is going to be a must on your tanking champions. After that, selfish defender, really, really powerful, decrease the damage an ally receives from the first enemy hit in each round by 20%. This champion will receive that damage instead. That's a big, big damage mitigator for the arena on nukes coming your way. The nuker, the first hit, is usually the one that you have to be worried about the most. And then last but not least is Bulwark. Decreases the damage all allies receive by 5%. This champion will receive that damage instead. Very, very powerful ability to have in uh, you know conjunction with all the other buffs that you're going to bring to the table to help keep your champions alive. And the last thing on your tank, guys, probably going to be taking a lot of damage. So pick up Shadow Heal. Heals this champion by 6% of their max HP each time an enemy is healed. Occurs once per turn. That could be really beneficial to just kind of annoying your opponent and keeping your tank alive. Tip number 16 is the best artifacts to farm in all the traditional dungeons, guys. Ice Golem Peak by far is going to be Reflex. Very, very strong set. Uh, quick disclaimer, though. There's usable sets and niche sets in really every dungeon that you can get utility out of. These are just my favorites and generally seen as the strongest in terms of the meta right now at the time of this recording here in early 2023. Fire Knight castle has a lot of good stuff namely savage and regeneration are really really sought after right now stun shield are really good too as well as crit damage and then on uh dragon's lair uh speed is still the best lifesteal in the early game as well stower is good for you know clan boss for, for mitigating damage on aoe attacks so those are the best kind of artifact sets from traditional dungeons right now in the meta in Raid Shadow Legends. Tip number 17 is, you'll see I have a bunch of shards. I have 314 Void Shards, 7 Sacred Shards, 3 Ancients, but I'm not opening any of them because for new players out there, wait for a two-time chance. <laughs> because it's super important that you only have a 0.5% chance at getting a legendary champion. So bumping that up to one might not sound like much, but you really want to save your shards, if at all possible, for two-time events pretty much no matter what. I guess the only exception, guys, would be if you know you're close to your Mercy Timer, if you keep track of this yourself, and there's a 10 time Champion event where you know you're due to pull a Legendary because of your own Mercy Timer. Tip number 18, don't know what to farm, don't know what to do, go ahead and take a look at your tournaments and always use your energy farming a dungeon that has a corresponding tournament if you can. So why not get extra rewards by farming dungeon right now? Hey, not only can I get all that speed gear that we just spoke about, but I can get an epic skill to Home, some chicken, some gems, etc. So look at your tournaments and use that to dictate where you're going to farm and when in terms of the traditional dungeons in Raid Shadow Legends. Tip number 19, guys, is always, always, always prioritize your faction wars. Use every single one of your faction keys. I've been a bad boy and I have two left over here and I will use those in the next five hours and three minutes. Why? Because of two reasons. Glyphs are so important in this game. Glyphs are used to, art uh, to upgrade artifact stats, the substats of artifacts. And if you glyph out every artifact on a champion, it's going to give you a massive difference in terms of their overall strength and their overall stats. So glyphs are not to be ignored, even for beginners, players in the game, even if you can only farm stage, you know, one of, of Demon Spawn Crypt, go ahead and farm that and get your glyphs. Moreover, you'll also be able to forge or farm material to forge more perception gear. And we already spoke about it. Perception is probably the best artifact set in the game right now. So make sure you farm again, your faction wars every day. Tip number 20 guys we just kind of alluded to it make sure you use all of your keys okay i cannot stress this enough guys using your keys i have two left i want to use two battles on stage three why because i want one star glyphs one star speed glyphs are extremely valuable in this game even if you're the end game because oftentimes as you progress in raid shadow legends you will need to speed tomb a team whether for clan boss or anywhere else so getting one extra speed is actually going to be really important on some artifacts we don't get a speed glyph that time but those one star glyphs actually can really help you so do not ignore the earlier stages of faction wars tip number 21 this should be super obvious guys but always prioritize prioritize clan boss the old school demon lord of clan boss this is really the only way in this game to actually farm i say that in quotations because this rng involved legendary skill tomes sacred shards void shards basically the stuff that is the most difficult to get inside this game so eventually you want to be able to go to ultra nightmare and two kid every single day that is all 
also important to find a clan that is basically working on the same, beating, destroying the same level difficulty that you are on, that you're targeting on your progression on your account. Find a clan that's kind of around the same, uh, I guess, trajectory as you are as a player in Raid Shadow Legends. Tip number 22, guys, is the first three champions that you should be maxing. First, start out with your starter. So every new account, as I mentioned, my favorite is Kale, but whether it's Kale, Galek, Aethel, or Elhane, you want to go with your starter. After that, you want to go to the campaign and you want to pick up one of the best campaign farmable champions in the game from stage nine, the Dreadlands. It's none other than War Maiden. She's one of the best debuffers that you have access to inside the early game. She's going to help you all all the way to the end game. She has a big version of Decreased Defense. Decreased Defense is like defense through offense, right? You, you make the other team take so much more damage with this AoE decreased defense. You definitely want to book, use your rare books and book it all up to with confidence. You will not regret investing in War Maiden. Champion number three is going to be a champion that you get for free after just playing the game for 30 days. And that is going to be High Katoon. She's very, very good, a good speed champion. And she is a, uh, where is she? She's an epic champion as well. So it will kind of help you with diversifying the resources that it takes to upgrade a champion. You don't want to always Always just upgrade champions of one rarity because you'll have finite amounts of books, skill tomes for each rarity. So High Katoon is going to be tremendous. Increased speed, fill turn meters, and an AoE decreased turn meter. Very good control champion, and she'll be a staple of your teams for a long, long time. Tip number 23 is the basics of speed tuning in arena or a dungeon team. Basically, we want to have our speed booster go uh, first, so our buffer or our speed booster on our team. What they're going to do is increase turn meter of all allies, in this case by 30%. That's going to allow the rest of the team to kind of catch up to that fastest champion. Next up, you want either a control or a debuffer champion. So in this case, it's going to be Madame Sarah. She's going to come in and debuff the enemy team with decreased defense, decreased attack. War Maiden would be another example of a champion that would fill this role. A speed booster would be an example of, well, High Katoon. So two of the champions that we just spoke about. Out. And then the last champion will be your nuker. So your nuker can actually be the slowest on your team. In this case, I have Trunda and she is the slowest on this particular team. So it doesn't make any sense, whether it's a dungeon or whether it's the, the arena, to have your nuker going before your debuffer. They're not going to take advantage of that decreased defense on the enemies, thus really wasting a valuable part of your team, a valuable component of your team that is really a staple of most dungeon teams in the game. Tip number 24, guys, is prioritizing critical rate and critical damage over basically anything else for an attacker, especially for the arena. Now, we have Trunda. This is a late game build, guys, but I want to be very clear on this. I see so many new players in Raid Shadow Legends not putting 100% or more. You don't get any extra benefit it after 100%, but make sure you're hitting that 100% on the crit rate. That is really, really important. So for any nuker, for any damage dealer off of sheer damage, not like poisons and stuff like that, those are damage from debuffs, but damage from straight out AoE attacks, just nuking damage. We want to have 100% crit rate, and then we want to focus on crit damage and attack percentage or defense percentage. Now, a big reminder though, is after, on, on attack percentage, you don't have to overdo it. Don't be afraid to go defense percentage or HP percentage on the chest or on accessories on your nuker because what good is a dead nuker? You'd rather have your champions actually be alive, be able to take a hit or two versus just having them die, right? So after a, around 6,000 attack, you're better off investing a lot more into critical damage that will make a bigger impact on the overall damage of your nuker. Tip number 25, guys, do not always auto upgrade a champion just because they're legendary or epic. So as I mentioned earlier, I kind of alluded to this, is legendary skill tomes are so so, so difficult to find in this game. If you make the decision to farm up, say, two or three or four legendaries, especially in the early game, all the way to six stars, you invest all this energy and time and all these chickens, whatever you're using to upgrade all these legendaries, I can guarantee you you're not going to have enough books to actually get full, you know, impact of these legendaries. So A, either go after a legend legendary champion that you know you can get a lot of utility out of, even without fully booking them, or B, just follow the money skip or pulled on the legendary and rather focus on a champion like an epic or a rare champion that you know you can get utility out of you know you can get value out of this champion but it's going to be a lot easier you know it's going to be less expensive to ascend the champion and of course those books are going to be easier to come by for lesser rarities so also just basically allow your resources to help dictate who you want to upgrade next just don't always go for the highest rarity tip number 26 
Skill tomes, books, they're not even always necessary. Here's a cult brawler. We don't need skill tomes on a cult brawler in order to get a lot of utility out of this champion, a lot of which is coming out, out of his passive, right? So read the skills. Usually an extra turn reduction on a skill is going to be valuable. You're going to want to use your books. Usually taking a debuff from, say, 50 or 75% to land to 100 is going to be very valuable. But sometimes even a nuker, even a champion like Ronda, who we just looked at uh, on the last tip, I think, you know, if we're just using her as an arena nuker, for example, we don't need this to be a four turn instead of a five turn. You can get by with a champion like this. Sure, you're losing a tiny bit of damage on those books, but again, skill tones are so valuable. You don't need to fully book every champion. Tip 27 is how do you decide which champion to invest in next then? How do you decide? Well, the four factors, guys, I said there was three for a long time. Now I'm saying there's four and I just talked about one of them. It's the resources that you have. If you have a bunch of skill tomes, you know, for epic champions, may as well just go with an epic if things are very, very close otherwise between two champions, say, right? Or if you have three legendaries you want to upgrade, maybe pause on one of them and invest in a epic or a rare instead because of how much resources or how in resource intensive, I should say, those champions are, right? The other factors are going to be end game viability. Am I going to be using this champion in the end game? Are they going to be good or they're just going to last me, you know, a month or two? If so, you might want to pause or only take them to level 50. And then, of course, value over replacement, right? Uh, how good is the champion this champion is going to be replacing on the teams that I'm going to use them for? And then the last is versatility. How many different areas in the game can I use this champion? That obviously is going to inform your decision of who to invest in next. Tip number 28 is tips for Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair is a pretty basic dungeon, but poison is amazing. So poison champions, there's a bunch of them in the game. We talked about Kale. Uh, and then obviously champions that have instant activations like Xavier, like Eleanor Roll. I mean, they're hard to come by, but they're incredibly valuable. Other than that, guys, just stacking your team up with a bunch of poisons. The dragon should not pose any problems to you. It's just a matter of clearing the waves in front of the dragon. Tip number 29 is tips for Ice Golem's Peak. So Ice Golem's Peak, you got to be careful. A ton of damage, a bunch of enemy max HP champions, for example, on a team, you're going to wipe against the Ice Golem. Now, it's nice to have a, a deny revival on the two minions, because if they're alive, he'll ignore defense and do a lot more damage to you. But slow and steady usually wins the the race against the Ice Golem. If you're having trouble with just kind of moderate damage dealers versus just absolute nukers, well, go ahead and pull back even a little bit more because what's most important is actually clearing these levels and not wasting your energy. Rather than having like a 75% win rate, you'll be throwing away a lot of energy in return for, you know, just a little bit of time saved because you'll be throwing away the runs that don't actually end in a victory, right? Furthermore, you can go with shields. A champion like Miscreated Monster is super, super valuable in a dungeon like Ice Golem's Peak. Ally protect champions as well. Just make sure you can keep them alive. Maybe run a reviver. Champions like Scylla Drakes, great healers for Ice Golem because you're going to be taking a lot of damage. Tip number 30 is tips for Spider's Den. So Spider's Den, guys, up until, I don't know, around stage 16, maybe even stage 20, depending on your artifacts and your champions, you can get by with brute force. Enemy max HP champions like Coltar, champions like Royal Guard, champions like Armor Guard are going to be really, really good there. But stages 20 through 25, maybe even stages like 18 through 25, again, depending on your gear, you're going to want to kind of shift to an HP burn strategy. Champions like Mordecai, Achek the Wenderin, and maybe even go with some CC. Go with a stun champion so those burns can keep ticking on the mother spider. So be on the lookout for HP burn champions. They're going to be your best friend when we talk about the later stages of Spider's Den. Tip number 31 is tips for, not Dragon's Lair, but Fire Knight's Castle. So Fire Knight's Castle, we're looking for multi-hit A1 abilities. Champions like Cold Hearts with four hits on her A1 so strong. Champions like Allure with turn meter control on her A1 ability. Champions like Apothecary with triple hits on his A1 as well are all going to be great for getting that shield down from the Fire Knight. Furthermore, you're looking for uh, turn meter control, right? So again, champions like Allure, champions like Diabolus, champions like Lysandra, uh, champions like uh, Maneater. There we go on the A2. Stealing turn meter, reducing turn meter for once that shield is down. That way the shield doesn't go up again. That's going to be your key to victory for Fire Knight's Castle. Tip number 32, what about Sand Devil's Necropolis? Well, one of the best champions to get for Sand Devil's Necropolis is going to be from Godfrey's Crossing, which is stage 10 inside the campaign. Go ahead and pick up Muckstalker, previously an unused champion, very nothing crazy special, alluring in his kit, but the strangle ability.
ability, right? It's a two-turn sleep on a two-turn cooldown. Sleep is so imperative for the Sand Devil. Definitely invest in Muck Stalker. He'll help put that Sand Devil to sleep, and you'll have less issues dealing damage to him and healing in between rounds. Tip number 33, guys, even for an amazing champion like Python, who's really probably a bad example because he's one of the best fragment summon slash fusions that we have in a long time, but you should never, ever, ever in this game feel pressured to go for any fragment summon, any fusion champion ever. This game gives you tons of free champions. We've talked about a lot of them already, but there's a bunch more. Even your daily login rewards, right? You're getting Vizix, you're getting Grush, you're getting Sil the Drakes, Tanix, Hateflower, and maybe not Lordly Legionnaire, but uh, champions like Hykatoon that we spoke about earlier too. All these champions are tremendous, and there's a lot more that we're going to talk about in the rest of the tips here too. You do not need, especially to spend money, to get your hands on fusions and fragment summons. If you want to go for them, save your resources in advance, make it easier on yourself, take Take a look at the fusion calendar, plan in advance, but do not feel pressured to ever have to spend or go all in uh, for any fusion or fragment champion in this game ever. Um, I'm going to have to go ahead and sort of disagree with you there. Tip number 34, to that point guys, be mindful of special events and tournaments that are kind of sneakily placed by Plarium sometimes to get you to spend your resources right before a big event that you'll want to take part in. And they do that a lot. It's very sneaky, especially with shard events. Oftentimes they'll give us a really enticing 10 times champion event right before a fusion where we're going to have to pull our shards anyway. It's sneaky. It's not nice, but be on the lookout and Another reason to save your resources and to kind of have a heads up over uh, on the schedule what is to come, right? And make sure that you plan accordingly. Don't burn all your resources before a big event that you're going to need all your resources takes place. Tip number 35, if you're having difficulty farming your great hall, an easy strategy that you should be employing is going to the arena, going to your arena defense, and removing all these OP champions that you have there or whoever you have there. Remove them, put one food champion, be kind to others. Give them a nice gimme. Don't put some random beast with stone skin in there, right? Put a level one whatever in there. You're going to make an easy victory for everybody who's attacking you. So like this guy, this, this baby dude, right? He's just running a kale there. Have mercy. So it's going to be a nice, easy victory for yours truly. I will take it, and I'm going to be dropping trophies. That way I can kind of tread water in a certain area that's comfortable for me to pick up easy victories in the arena. When we think of the arena, we're not most players. 99% of players aren't thinking about, ooh, I want to be the best and the baddest and make the top player leaderboard. No, you just want to farm your great hall efficiently. And efficiently means going against fairly easy teams for you wherever you are. So find that comfort area and then strategically use that one-man defense strategy to make sure you're not moving up too far to where it's going to be very tr uh, tr troublesome to be able to farm all of those medals because every team's going to take you a while or you're going to lose. Speaking of great haul, guys, I don't care what you do, but prioritize accuracy first. Accuracy is king, again, in this game, and you can't upgrade your speed, so go for accuracy. Usually people start out with magic affinity accuracy because magic affinity is generally uh, seemed as the most common for meta champions in the game in terms of the affinity. After that, it doesn't really matter where you go, frankly. Some people tell you resistance, some people crit damage, some people defense. Uh, but the last thing you should do is attack because attack only benefits a small or at least half of the champions in the game. Think about it this way an attack percentage still, attack percentage champion still benefits from defense and HP, whereas an HP damage champion or a defense damage champion does not benefit at all from attack, so I would save attack for last. Tip number 37, guys, we talked about great champs that you can get in this game by not having to spend. Well, here's a few more for you guys. It's the power of the Bazaar in Tag Team Arena. It's a reason to play Tag Team Arena, guys, because we can go in here and collect fragments for Drexthar Blood Twin. He's a very, very good champion. You can collect them. They're three 360 a pop and you want to really unlock Drexstar because he's very very good especially against a lot of Doom Tower bosses. So he'll help you out a lot on your account. He's also a great burner for Spider which we spoke about earlier. After that we have two clan uh, shop champions. So if we go to our clan screen, we go to the clan shop. I mean, two tremendous champions is your Carl the Scourge and uh, Yannicka. They're both great nukers and control champion in your Carl. He got buffed recently. So these are two more champions that you can just use your clan gold and basically farm their fragments and eventually you'll get your hands on really capable end game champion. Tip number 38, guys. I don't have him on here because I already fused him, but the two, two of the permanent fusions in this game, Rosin Scarhide, and Broadmaw 
are actually really solid. Most players should pick up these fusions. Brahma received a pretty significant buff. You're going to need him even in the late game because there's a lizard man only epic champion secret room that's very, very difficult without Brahma. He's a reviver now. He's got increased crit rate, increased speed. He's a solid champion. Not the best in the world, but he's going to help you out in faction wars and again in Doom Tower. So don't be afraid to fuse Brahma. He's available for everybody to, uh, to fuse, excuse me, and work on fusing Rosin. Rosin's an old school legacy champion, lizard man legendary in this game, but he's great for turn meter control and for debuffing against bosses. Tip number 39, never, ever, ever buy artifacts from the shop, guys. Do not do it. Don't buy artifacts. Don't buy accessories. You can farm this stuff. You can partake in tournaments and you can get these artifacts and you don't know what the substats are going to be before you buy them. It's a total gamble. It's a total crapshoot. They're overpriced. Do not buy artifacts and accessories. I guess the only, and I mean the only exception I would say, if you're Jeff Bezos watching this video and you don't care, go for it. Or uh, if it's your very first champion and you just can't beat Spider and you see some decent accessories for say Dark Elf and to put on Kale, maybe consider it there, but that's really the only exception to that rule in my opinion. Tip number 40 is buy ancient shards in the market. Even buy mystery shards in the market. Shards are great value in the market. Not only that, but you'll also complete your daily quest, purchase an item in the market, and once you claim it, you get five more arena tokens, some silver as well. So definitely buy mystery shards and especially ancient shards. You're limited to, I think, four or five a month. So just be careful and keep an eye out every day because ancient shards, again, are incredible value for 200k silver. Tip number 41, it's an old school one, but upgrade your gem mine, guys. Upgrading your gem mine always pays off if you play this game for a, d a decent amount of time. So I guess I'll rephrase. Upgrade your gem mine if you think you're going to be playing Raid Shadow Legends for another year or so, because it is going to pay quite the dividends in terms of your overall gem return in the long run. Tip number 42 is the easiest way to farm masteries for your champions, guys. It's obviously a Minotaur's Labyrinth, and if you don't want to pay 800 gems to max out your masteries for a champion, the easiest way is to go to get to stage 15. It's not that difficult to do, and then there's plenty of champions. You can just go uh, YouTube search it or Google it. There's so many champions. One of my favorites is actually an uncommon champion in lifesteal gear. If you put them in lifesteal and or regen, depending on the champion, you can easily farm even stage 15 with one champion. So let's just say I wanted to go ahead and get masteries on Manaya. I would pair the champion that I want to farm scrolls on with my miniature farmer. And then all the scrolls are going to go to that one champion. Tip number 43 guys is to use all your spots when farming experience in campaign. It's really important. Farming experience is, well, it's really expensive. So whether you're farming champions just to level them up that you want to build and use, or whether you're just farming food, make sure you're using all four slots because the total amount of HP, or excuse me, experience, let's just say they're getting a thousand experience here. It is going to be divided four ways in all of these spots, right? So Fellhound, who's already maxed out, is going to be eating 25% of all that experience. If I'm only farming two champions along with my campaign farmer, it's gonna, he's going to be eating up 33% of that experience, basically wasting it. If I'm only farming one, it's going to be a 50-50 split. I'm going to be wasting 50% of my experience, thus wasting energy. So always use all four of your spots when you're farming either food or champions that you want to upgrade. Tip number 44 is experience farming doesn't stop in campaign. Uh, this is stage 25 of Dragon, and I'm lucky to have enough to have Nishak, Vermin Lord, who can actually solo. So whether it took me three champions, four champions, two champions, Champions or one to beat a dungeon, you're better off, especially if you're farming like overnight, not wasting your energy on a bunch of campaign farms and dragon farms because it doesn't matter if it's taking you two minutes or six minutes because you're sleeping or you're not with your device or by your computer. So it doesn't really matter. So you're better off getting experience for champions that you want to upgrade anyway while you're farming. You're not going to get nearly as much experience as you would in campaign, but it is going to add up and make a difference and save you just thousands, if not millions of energy over the years. Tip number 45, guys, is take advantage of your team setup and your AI customization. Now, the best way to do this, I found, is simply go through the run on manual and try to get it to where everything is perfectly optimized manually and kind of make a note of every decision that you're making, every move that you're making, correct your mistakes until you have everything right, and then go in there and round by round, champion by champion, you can customize what you want them to 
use, and more importantly, sometimes what you don't want them to use. So I don't want Seal of Magic in the first round by Prince Kaimar. Uh, on round one, Dark Kale, I want him to prioritize his A2. How did I find out all this information? Simple, guys. Trial and error on manual, and then I was able to make a perfect team using my team setup and my AI customization. Dark Kale, for example, against the boss, I only want him instant activating poisons in HP Burn because we have quite a few of them on this team. Allure against the boss, I only want her using her turn meter uh, in her three-time hitter on her A1, right? I want her in there for control. So round three, I'm shutting off the other abilities. You can really make or break and save yourself so much time by taking full advantage of AI customization and team setup. Tip number 46 is getting value out of some amazing websites in Raid Shadow Legends. So I'll just share a few of my favorites. We have Hell ha Hell Hades, excuse me, dot com. So many tools, so many tier lists. Just visit the website. Take my word for it. We have the king of speed tuning for everything in the game. It is deadwoodjedi.com. Make sure you bookmark that page. All the speed tunes for all the unkillable teams in every clan boss comp imaginable. You will find there, guys. Check out raidshadowpro.gg. Raidshadowpro.gg. Very good for tier list calculators, stuff like that. Offer calculators as well if you want to find out what's good, what's not. Check that out. And then we have ayumilove.net. More champion guides, tier lists, and build guides, how to, you know, what uh, artifacts to put on which champion, etc., etc., along with patch notes. So take advantage of those websites. Tip number 47, guys, if you're going to start a new account, a second account, you have a family member who wants to start an account, use my download link. That is not self-promotion. I promise you guys, you're going to get a free epic champion, a free ancient shard, free silver, all free stuff for a new account, and I will have an updated link for you guys to click in the pinned comment of today's video in the description below. Tip number 48 is a way to say a lot of energy when farming up food. So go to your mystery shards, summon 10 common, uncommon, maybe you'll get lucky and get a good rare champion as well. You have all these champions, then come right over to the tavern guys, and then you can take your common champion, use one brew, and then three other of the comments to sacrifice, and that's going to get them right to the next level. Nice and easy. Rather, again, then upgrade ranks. You can just use more of those common champions, right? But that's a nice, easy way to get them ascended early on without having to waste your energy, or excuse me, ranked up, without having to waste your energy in campaign. Tip number 49, guys, is two uncommon champions who are actually worth keeping still today. These champions are not new to the game, but they're two champions that, again, don't use them as food. Actually build them, because they're very good. One of them is Sacred Order Uncommon Armager. He has Terminator on his A1. He has an enemy max HP and Deny it Revival on his A2 on a two-turn cooldown. The other one we actually just spoke about, it is Shield Guard. He is a Barbarian, and he, again, an uncommon champion. Very easy to find. He has this a nice A2 here as a defense base. Easy to keep alive. Fills the champion's turn meter by 20% on each critical hit, and this is on a two-turn cooldown on an AoE. Very, very good champion in Lifesteal. He can solo a bunch of content in the game, so don't sleep on Shield Guard. And tip number 50, guys, is all about Blessings. So Blessings, I still personally love Brimstone, even after the nerf. It's my favorite to put on Legendary, so I'm using against Hydra Clan boss, or really any boss, because it does so much damage that Smite debuff. Uh, but on top of that, Polymorph is amazing inside the arena. Crushing Rend is pretty good as well for epic champions to consider but i still personally think that phantom touch is one of the strongest blessings in the game again even after the nerf when in doubt on a damage dealer or really basically any champion go especially rare champions go with phantom touch phantom touch is still an incredible blessing that you guys definitely want to take advantage of so guys there you go that's 50 tips for raid shadow legends here in 2023 hopefully you enjoyed the video if you did i invite you to subscribe to the channel guys thank you and as always take care guys